introducing Mr. Coker, and then uh, I'll let you know when we're ready for you. Okay. Today's presentation will cover four areas of IT valuation. We'll cover the type of IT assets, including some you may not, may not have considered, principles and factors in valuing IT assets, establishing royalty rates, and patent infringement issues. The webinar will also discuss the uses of IT data by the legal industry, such as sale and purchase of IT assets, mergers and acquisitions involving IT assets, licensing and other contract negotiations, patent infringement issues and litigation, and tax matters. Our presenter today is Mr. Donald Coker. He has 20 plus years experience in management of banks, savings and loans, credit companies, mortgage banking companies, and a governmental financial institution regulatory agency. He has held positions that include member of the board of directors, executive vice president, senior vice president, manager of lending, manager of mortgage banking, and regulatory supervisory agent, which is tantamount to CEO. Mr. Coker was a member of the loan committee, executive committee, audit committee, and pension plan board, and has served as a corporate officer for various financial institutions subsidiaries. After a 20-year career in banking that included time with Citigroup and entities that are now J.P. Morgan Chase, Regions Financial, and Bank of America, and a couple of years as a governmental banking regulator, Don Coker began practicing as an expert witness in banking, finance, valuation, and related fields in 1989. He has been engaged as an expert witness for plaintiffs and defendants for four, over 550 cases nationwide. Mr. Coker's clients have included hundreds of law firms, including 47 of the country's top 350, over 90 banks, the FDIC and the IRS, individuals and business entities of all types, and four members of the Forbes 400 list. He has testified 129 times, 99 times at deposition, and 30 times in court. Mr. Coker has been interviewed by or quoted in over 50 publications, he has written a best-selling business book on commercial real estate finance and has written over 90 articles on banking, finance, and valuation subjects. Uh, I just want to let everybody know, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat feature, which is located next to my pointer, and we'll break halfway through the presentation and at the end for a question and answer. Please note that in order to obtain CLE credit for this presentation, you must complete the survey that's at the end of the presentation, and we'll have a slide at the end of the presentation letting you know which states are CLE eligible for this presentation. Also during the presentation, we had a tax code for anybody that needs it for CLE credit. During the presentation, we will ask the participants to put in this word, royalty, into the chat feature uh, throughout the presentation as our tax code. All right, I'm going to pass the past presentation over to Mr. Coker, and we look forward to the presentation. Well, Mr. Coker, the presentation is now yours. You can go through as you need. Thank you very much, Brooke. And first of all, I apologize for keeping people waiting. I had unprecedented problems with my uh, computer, but finally got them worked out. But uh, anyway, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to be talking today about the uh, uh, uses of IP data uh, by the by the legal industry. Uh, here are some of the items we're going to cover: the sale and purchase of IP assets. You might be on either side of that, uh, and you may be discussing the technical aspects of the uh, of the IP assets, or you may just be discussing the value of the assets. Uh, uh, either one, either one is something that uh, comes up. Mergers and acquisitions involving IP assets, well, of course, the, the reason for a lot of mergers and a lot of acquisitions uh, are basically to acquire IP assets. Uh, so that uh, becomes a big part of the valuation of the, uh, uh, that goes into the formulation of the purchase price and so forth. Uh, also, we're going to be, we'll talk a little bit about licensing and other contract negotiations. Uh, of course, IP values come into play there uh, in terms of, uh, um, what uh, you, you have to look at what the the, the use of the technology uh, or whatever the IP asset is uh, can generate in terms of uh, uh, of actual cash flow and, and give that some kind of value. 
And of course, the uh, the, the current uh, subject that we hear mostly uh, covering, uh, uh, mostly uh, referring to IP valuation these days, has to do with patent infringement issues and litigation involving patent infringement. And uh, the uh, uh, the we'll talk a little more about that later in detail, but uh, that that's a real complicated issue that can be uh, changed uh, changed around in a lot of ways, but. Uh, the last uh, area is uh, tax matters. Uh, I've had some cases I've had to work on that involve uh, the uh, how, how the how the IRS looks at uh, these uh, intellectual property assets uh, and, and what uh, what kind of value they put on those and what kind of life they put on them. So uh, tax matters is uh, is an important issue uh, involving IP valuation. How do I move to my next slide? Uh, go up to the arrows on the right-hand side. Uh, there you go. There we go. Uh, types of IP assets. Um, well, there are a lot of different types, but here is what we're going to be talking about uh, mostly uh, patents. Okay, and you sometimes will find that you'll have a single patent, or you may find groups of patents. Uh, that make up a particular technology. Uh, so, you know, you, you would have to value, if, you, if they're in a group, you would want to value them as a group uh, and rather than to try to carve out individual uh, values for those, but you could do it either way. Uh, software, uh, of course, that's another uh, big, big time IP asset uh, that you to be dealing with, I'm sure. And uh, that could be a standalone program or it can piggyback on another patented technology. For example, I had a client that um, it developed. Uh, Mr. Coker, a, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We can, we can hear a lot of background noise and some feedback. So um, if we could limit good. the background noise and just speak up a little bit, that would be great for the participants. I can hear that background noise as well, but that's not coming from here, I assure you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, anyway, the, uh, I was saying I had a software that can be a standalone program or can piggyback on another patented technology. And uh, I had a client that uh, developed a program that, uh, as he described it, it basically sat on top of Skype. So you have to have the Skype technology. Then you buy this gentleman's technology and you put on that and then it enables you to do some other things that Skype will not do. So uh, you can have that kind of situation. Uh, next, we have trademarks, uh, brand names, and logos that refer to a product or a service. Uh, I had to do a very large one of these over in um, over in Europe. That uh, actually it was in in Russia, but it covered all of Europe. That involved the logo for the um, International um, Financial Accounting Standards Board over there, and uh, so that uh, that's something that is is rather challenging to come up with a value. With um, copyrighted assets. I don't really do much with that. I would, I, I would if I were asked to. I've just not been asked to do much in the way of copyrighted asset work. Um, of course, that's more your written works, artworks, musical compositions, uh, designs, and, uh, and of course you have those in both formats, in, uh, in printed hard copy format and also in electronic formats. In uh, addition to the more uh, uh, more common types of, uh, of IP assets, like we've been discussing, uh, there are other items too, such as uh, that are that that you may not think of as an asset, uh, but it really is because it does and it does have value. Such as I have one listed here: favorable business factors, uh, supplier contracts that offer an owner an economic advantage over what a competitor would have to pay for the same materials, uh, things like that. Um, also, you have customer-centered intangible assets, such as a core customer base, a long-term uh, customer relationship uh, that you may uh, get a lot of business out of, uh, customer lists and existing customer orders uh, that you may be filling over a long period of time. Uh, that can show up as an asset uh, because that could be theoretically sold to somebody. An example of what we're talking about here is uh, I, I also do uh, – Consulting work in terms of business plans and, and helping people get businesses organized and that sort of thing. And I had a little uh, aerospace supply company 
uh, several years ago that came to me and wanted me to help them put together a business plan so that they could go obtain financing from their bank. And um, this is a, is a very small company, about 25 employees, and they sell basically what you and I would probably refer to as doohickeys uh, to the aerospace uh, manufacturing industry, fasteners and things like that. And they had a relationship and still have it with one of the um, major aerospace suppliers where that supplier just would not even think about buying uh, one of these doohickeys that this company handles from anybody else. And, uh, you know, when you have a relationship like that, that's worth some money, and uh, that can be valued. Uh, other IP assets that you may not normally think of in that context is uh, would be workforce-related assets, such as a trained workforce. I was asked to value one time the or provide a value for the, a, a trained workforce uh, in, a, in a case the IRS was handling, and I was only happened to be on the IRS side of that case. Um, other things like that would be typically you hear about the insurance agent with the book of business. Uh, that same philosophy applies to a stockbroker uh, network that you may have. Uh, has a, a large book of business through all of its stockbrokers and things like that. Uh, I've done a lot of, since I was in banking, a lot of mortgage and lending related work and uh, that also refers to the uh, value of, a, of an established loan origination network and that sort of thing. Although today a lot of people might give that a negative value uh, you know, for a lot of those companies. But, uh, we also have contract-based intangibles uh, that provide an economic benefit, and that's like mortgage servicing rights and things like that. Um, also, uh, you have uh, war some warranty service companies where they receive uh, like a, a yearly payment on a on a warranty for some particular product or whatever, uh, and they uh, have received the, can receive the right to receive that uh, warranty payment. And then they have to do the work if it comes up during uh, during the year, during the warranty period. Um, and any other contractual arrangements that provide uh, a stream of future cash flows, uh, you can value those as an intangible asset. Uh, there are a lot of assets that are kind of on the fence. Uh, and some people uh, that are real estate oriented, uh, such as uh, leaseholds, uh, you know, clearly are a real estate uh, asset, but uh, some people think of those in terms of being an IP asset. Um, air rights, water rights, and riparian rights, uh, rights to use water. Uh, I have seen, uh, very recently, I have seen a, a real estate uh, deal where it was waterfront land and they did not have the right to use the water. And that made a tremendous difference in the, uh, in the value of the property. Uh, and uh, I guess last one, lastly, we have goodwill here. That's uh, that's a term that's not as important as it used to be because the IRS used to let you depreciate that, and now they don't let you depreciate that anymore. But uh, that basically is the net present value of the excess earnings of a company uh, due to its superior performance when compared to the earnings of other similar companies. Uh, in other words, it's the advantage you get uh, by buying that particular company. And uh, I also note here that uh, in, in stock market terms, uh, you, you typically hear of goodwill as the amount that's paid over and above what the, what the normal market value would be for a, um, for a company uh, because of, of a company's superior performance when you compare it to a competitor. Kind of a, kind of a hard to, to term to, to define. Hey, Don. Sorry to interrupt you again. Um, could you just speak up just a little bit louder for the participants? Uh, yes, I'll, I'm turning the volume up here. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, now, on, on valuing IP assets, I, I've got four key issues here that I think we need to keep in mind. When either valuing an IP asset, or if you're reviewing a valuation of IP assets. And if you're doing that, doing a review where the other side in the case has provided uh, an IP valuation, <coughs> pardon me, I suggest that you get some valuation professional to look at that along with you. Uh, because it's not, uh, it's not real, this is not an easy, uh, easy task, valuing IP assets. But let's look at these four issues. Number one, um, 
the, the most accurate indicator uh, on, on most values, and this certainly applies to IP assets, uh, is the net present value of the future cash flows that you can expect to generate uh, over a reasonably anticipated life of the asset. And uh, that, as I said, that, that, that's not anything unique to IP assets. That applies to, uh, applies to other assets as well, uh, such as some real estate assets and business assets. Um, but it does, it is a little different because you do have the factor of the, of, of the, of the fact that this is net present value here. And you may have some negative, uh, negative time going in that you have to factor into this. Uh, that is then later offset by the positive cash flows that come in from the use of the asset or the sale of it or whatever. Um, also, you've got the factor here of the reasonably anticipated life. Uh, you know, you, you have to look at what uh, time period you're going to be looking at uh, at present uh, at, at, a, uh, in, at an income stream in order to present value that. <clears throat> the second factor here is. Um, that uh, I have found that it is quite often uh, helpful to value a business, uh, excuse me, an IP asset, as if it were a standalone business. Um, for example, if you have a group of patents that relate to a better copying machine, it would most likely be marketed, uh, those, those assets would, as a bundle of assets, since some of the patents may rely on other patents within that group of patents. Um, also, another example of... Uh, Valuing as a standalone business, I think I give this as another example later, and I'll not duplicate it if I do. Um, but I had to value a uh, patent that included a that basically was a, a process uh, for determining cancer uh, of a certain type, and uh, this process was going to be marketed initially in China, and so uh, I, I found that it was better to value this as a standalone business. Uh, like a startup business, uh, and, and because th th there wasn't any, uh, in this particular case, there wasn't any entity that was going to be buying this that was already doing anything similar. So we valued it as a standalone business. Uh, the third point here, the third factor, in some cases uh, the value of an IP asset uh, relates to an advantage that the asset provides over a competitor's similar asset. And uh, that would be a, a long-term supplier contract. Uh, you, you, could, you could look at, uh, at the, the favorable terms in that and uh, calculate a net present value of the advantage in pricing produced by the contract over its life. In other words, if you sign a long-term contract, uh, you're probably going to get some kind of, uh, some kind of break there uh, in, in something you're buying to, to use in your business. So you can quanti you can try to quantify that difference and, and present value that uh, to to get a, an IP valuation uh, for today. And um, the same thing here with goodwill. Uh, that keep in mind that goodwill is the incremental advantage that the owner of the asset sees at the bottom line. Um, and so you're not valuing the entire asset; you're valuing goodwill which is simply the incremental advantage uh, in the situation. And the fourth factor is uh, sometimes uh, the value of an IP asset relates to the cost that was required to be expended in order to develop the IP asset compared to what a competitor would have to spend to develop a similar IP asset. Sometimes this is just the only way to do this uh, evaluation and it's a, it's a difficult way to do it, and it's, uh, it's, it involves a great deal of speculation, in my opinion. Um, and you have to uh, go and seek information from technical people that know something about that and incorporate that into your valuation uh, so that you can uh, formulate uh, your, your best estimate of the value. Um, an example of this I mentioned earlier would be the value of a trained workforce. That was a case, one of the cases I had to do for the IRS. Um, the value of a trained workforce should be roughly equivalent to what it would take to reproduce a similar trained workforce. Um, 
So, you know, you can quantify those uh, those various factors. All right, we'll take a few moments for a little question and answer break here. Uh, we do ask at this time uh, all of the participants, if you could, please go into the chat feature and submit to me the word royalty as our passcode for some of our CLE credits. Thank you. All right, we got some of our codes coming in. Thank you to the participants for that. Um, we do have a couple questions, Mr. Foker. The first one is, have you found that IP valuations sometimes are in the context of a divorce? Uh, yes, I have. I, I have seen, uh, I've had cases that involve uh, the valuation of IP assets and divorces. Also, I've had business, many business valuation cases in divorces, but I've, uh, they're more common than the IP, but I have had IP valuations like that. Okay, we have a question here from Andre. He wants to know, is the cost to create the IP valid for licensing purposes? Uh, can you repeat that, please? Sure. Is the cost to create the IP valid for licensing purposes? No. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know that I understand that. Uh, it, uh, that, that would... It depends on the IP asset, and uh, it w if you were uh, uh, in one of these situations, like I just described right before the, the Q&A break here, uh, it would be uh, where you had to, to resort to the cost uh, as, as the value for it. Uh, that would that would be a factor you would use in the valuation, but it would not be uh, the licensing amount. You would have to factor in the the time period over which you were going to be using the asset. Okay. Uh, Andre has a follow-up question to that. He asks, is it fair to use the cost of development of the IP to determine the licensing fee? Fair. Uh, yes. It, it, it's part of the uh, – it's, it's one of the factors you use, but as I said, you would also use the uh, – uh, you would have to factor in the uh, time that uh, you had the uh, – use of the asset. Okay. We also have a question from Charles. Uh, he wants to know, do you have any advice for valuing IP in a startup where revenue streams are not clear or have not begun? Is the only method to still estimate future cash flows? Um, that That is, is generally you know, the, the estimating the future cash flows. That, this is where the debt comes in. Estimating the net future cash flows comes in because you have to look at the negative part on the front end as well. Uh, because you can't just, uh, just start this uh, valuation period when the, uh, after the asset is created, uh, unless you're already in a situation where the asset is created. Uh, if you're valuing the IP before the, the actual, uh, intellectual property asset is is developed, um, then you've got a situation where you have to include the negatives of what it takes you to get into that uh, to start with. Okay, we have one more question here. Uh, what about international IP assets? Can those assets be valued by a U.S.-based evaluation professional, or does the attorney need to locate a valuation professional in the country where the assets are patented? Uh, that's that's going to depend a lot on the individual situation, but uh, certainly a uh, uh, a person in the United States uh, can value assets anywhere if they can get the information available, or in some cases you may not even need the information, uh, any information from the foreign country. I did a valuation uh, a few years ago, and it was a big project for a company in Greece that was uh, marketing a uh, kind of like a Rubik's Cube on steroids, uh, whereas the Rubik's Cube, cube was a 3 by 3 by 3 uh, on a side uh, deal. These guys had uh, Rubik's Cubes, and they're not Rubik's Cubes, they're, 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 they have another name, 
that uh, were um, five on a side, uh, seven on a side, nine on a side, and even, I think, 11 on a side. Uh, I mean, they were just exponentially more complicated than Rubik's Cubes. Uh, and they, they were gonna, their marketing plan was to market those uh, in about, I think, about 40 countries. And I was able to do that without any uh, any specialized information that had to do with the uh, uh, with any of those particular countries. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we can continue on with uh, the rest of the presentation. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, this uh, we're con sort of continuing here with uh, what I was talking about on the. Uh, on the valuation of the IP assets. Uh, this is that uh, cancer detection program that I was mentioning uh, just a few minutes ago, and I said I won't duplicate that, so I'll, uh, I'll just let that go. But I had to value that uh, uh, that technology as basically a standalone uh, business. Um, this is a is a, a very uh, valuing IP is a very complicated uh, matter. And uh, here are some of the factors that we run into. Some of a few, uh, I mean, a few of, of, a, of a large number that we run into uh, is the asset to be licensed for some uh, definite period, or is it to be sold? Uh, so you know that uh, that would would because of the time factor that would determine whether or not uh, the the price was going to include. Uh, uh, a, long, a, a short period or a long period, of course. So, um, if the asset is to be licensed, is there a single licensee, or will it be licensed to multiple licensees? Well, you can. Uh, if you have a technology, uh, and you you have the option of licensing it totally to one one user that may want to use it, or you may want a user that doesn't want an exclusive right to use it. So you could. You could license it to multiple parties there. And, of course, uh, the fact that you have exclusive uh, use of it is, of course, worth, is of course worth a lot more. Um, if the asset is a patent uh, and it's already running, uh, how many years has it been in use and how many years of patent protection remain? Well, that's pretty obvious. Uh, it, it, it has to do with the time that you can use that uh, asset. Uh, if a patent application has been filed but a patent is not being granted, there is a risk that the patent application might be rejected, uh, which means that the subject IP rights are worthless. So uh, you have to consider that uh, in the evaluation. And uh, let's talk about the qualifications of an IP valuation professional. Uh, there's really no professional certification that ensures that a valuation professional can produce a credible IP valuation. The reason for that is, uh, you know, there, there, and there are certifications uh, that different associations grant. But as I said, that is no guarantee that, uh, uh, that the valuation professional will be able to do the job because IP valuation is so broad and it covers just so many different possible areas uh, that you just can't possibly do a training and testing program to ensure that somebody can do a good job on anything. So, uh, you know, don't expect to find that out there. Um, the most important qualifications, in my opinion, you know, that the evaluation professional must be capable of producing and, de and defending a credible valuation based upon sound valuation principles and the person's own education, professional background, and experience. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory there. Any IP valuation should conform to the evaluation standards established by the Appraisal Foundation, and uh, th these are known as the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal, uh, excuse me, Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, often referred to as the USPAP standards. And uh, those are available online. Uh, you can, uh, if you want to look at those, you can find those under the Appraisal Foundation. I think it's the appraisalfoundation.org or actually USPAP.org. But, you know, don't get too, tie, uh, too, too tangled up in those. You know, let the person doing your valuation do that for you. 
And they include a little certification that goes on the, you know, on the, on the valuation that uh, tells you, um, that certifies that uh, you followed certain procedures and so forth. And, so, yeah, I need to interrupt you, Mr. Coker. Um, we're having a hard time hearing you, so if we could just speak up. And for whatever reason, we're getting some background um, noise, and I, I'm not sure where it's coming from, but if it's not coming from you, whoever it is in the background, um, please be considered the presenter during the presentation. Thank you. Uh, okay, I will speak up some. And the background noise is not here. I, uh, uh, I, I can hear it as well, but it's not uh, really that annoying. Uh, okay, we're continuing on the IP uh, valuation professional qualifications. Um, as I said, don't get tangled up in those uh, USPAP standards. Uh, your, your valuation professional will will uh, handle that for you. And um, keep in mind that it, uh, this is really a unique group of skills that are required in order for a valuation professional to produce a credible intellectual property valuation, such as uh, you need to know something about the IP creation, ownership, and transfer process. Um, in fact, I myself have, uh, have a, uh, uh, a patent uh, application that I developed, and, and before it was ever approved as a patent, I sold that. Um, so, I, you know, I have experience in doing that. And you, you probably won't find another valuation professional that has done that. I wouldn't make that one of my... Uh, gotta's, uh, gotta haves on the, on hiring uh, evaluation professional, but it's nice to to have that. Um, the, the professional needs to know a lot of different methodologies for valuing things. Uh, back when I was uh, years ago, I was doing an article. I was asked to do an article about Lawyers Weekly USA, and um, they wanted me to give a uh, write an article on. Uh, types of valuation of businesses, which plays into IP valuation a lot. And uh, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that there are three methods of valuing something, and they get that from from the uh, from what they know uh, when they read something on the internet about real estate appraisals. You know, you've got uh, you've got your three methods there: your cost, your market data, and your uh, your income producing. And uh, but I, when I was writing this article for Lawyers Weekly USA, uh, I think I put 24 different valuation methods uh, in there, and they chopped it down to about 13 uh, for the article because it was it, it taken up two pages in the newspaper. So uh, you know you need to know a lot of different kinds of methodologies so that you can deal with these oddball situations that come up in the valuation of IP assets. Um, and it goes without saying, the person needs to be knowledgeable in the principles of financial mathematics, especially if they relate to market returns and uh, timing factors uh, and the expenditures and, uh, and receipt of funds. That's the net factor I talked about earlier. And uh, of course, how they how you put all these into the into the mix to come up with a value. Uh, also, I found that it's very helpful to know. Uh, corporate financing and investment banking techniques, and I was fortunate to uh, learn that myself, uh, starting in college, and then in my various jobs that I had in bank, excuse me in banking and, uh, and and working with investment bankers on, on various uh, projects. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, you have to be able to find information. And that's that's a little tougher than it uh, may sound at first uh, at first uh, first gloss there, um, because uh, a lot of times there's oddball information involved in these things that you may need to find. I had to go down and run down information on the rebate processing industry one time, and uh, to do a valuation for a divorce, and uh, that was very challenging. And uh, you need to be knowledgeable in how to determine and analyze market factors. Um, this is something that uh, hopefully uh, if somebody that is working corporate finance uh, has some knowledge of, and that is uh, uh, in the context of how they can make a loan to a corporation and that corporation do something with that money that's going to produce a return uh, for them. Um, they need 
need to be knowledgeable in the various forms of business organization and the business systems and business management techniques uh, so that uh, they can make a realistic uh, appraisal of the, uh, uh, in, in, especially in a situation where you're going to be valuing something as a, uh, as a standalone business, as we discussed earlier. Um, even uh, though a lot of attorneys consider a CPA when they need an IP evaluation, uh, you can see from that above uh, cited list of skill requirements that many of those skills are really beyond the scope of a, of a CPA uh, since they're really never covered in their training or their experience. Uh, that's not to say no CPA is, is, is capable of doing this. Certainly some are, many are. Uh, and I've worked with some that have done that in the past. But uh, don't automatically expect, you know, a CPA to be able to do that for you. Um, this is just a follow-on to that, that you, an attorney would typically not turn to a CPA to value real estate since the CPA is not qualified to, to, to value real estate typically. Um, and similarly, C CPAs are not trained to, to quantify a, uh, a value for IP assets, which are just much more complicated than real estate assets. And uh, keep in mind that the IP valuation professional you choose, uh, they very well have to testify at deposition and at trial. And I've done a lot of depositions. In fact, I've got number 100 coming up uh, later this week. And I can tell you that the IP valuation um, uh, and even the business valuation uh, depositions are much tougher than uh, most others that have to do with things such as banking standards and so forth that I uh, give opinions on. Uh, they're very tough. So, you know, don't don't uh, underestimate the importance here of, of the ability to testify. Uh, I've seen people that are extremely knowledgeable in their particular field, but they just don't have the experience to be able to try to think three turns ahead of a lawyer in a deposition and try to keep up with them and know where they're going. So that's, that is a skill itself. I guess that's an IP asset. Maybe I should try to value that. Um, IP litigation by its nature generally is high-dollar litigation. And uh, for that reason, it, that often involves attorneys that are cut above the normal uh, range of experience and, and, and talents for lawyers, uh, which is another reason why you need to consider the testifying ex experience of the uh, evaluation professional. And uh, also the uh, cross-examination skills uh, of these attorneys are, are quite, uh, quite good. And uh, you would not want to roll the dice uh, on whether or not an IP valuation professional you hire that has not testified can all of a sudden become a great testifying uh, expert for you. Um, our next point is that IP valuation is a complex matter. It's uh, challenging to, as I said, to think three moves ahead of an opposing attorney. And uh, you would like nothing better than to lead your IP professional into a trap that discredits the, the, his valuation and, and then accordingly uh, your whole case. And uh, when, you're, when you're choosing an IP valuation professional, have the discipline to insist that the IP valuation professional that you choose has solid testifying experience. As I said, it's, it's not something you want to roll the dice on. And let's talk a few minutes about royalty rates. Uh, this is just sort of a follow-on to IP valuations because, uh, as you would as you would guess, uh, it, as it says there in the first point, a royalty payment is made to the owner of an intellectual property asset for the use of that property over some period of time. And uh, so, of course, you're going to try to value that uh, royalty payment uh, in some relationship to the value of the asset. And uh, that's uh, that. So, so that's why those two are, are issues: the IP valuation and the royalty rates are so intertwined. Uh, second point is a royalty payment can be based on any method agreed to by the parties. Um, and for example, the royalty might be based upon a set amount for each widget, uh, each item of production. 
uh, or it could be a percentage of the sales of the of the items, uh, or it could be a royalty rate that changes as sales change, which uh, if the sales go up, the uh, uh, maybe the uh, the royalty rate goes up because it's uh, it's producing a successful result for the uh, for the owner, or it could go down because uh, they're going to be uh, getting a a larger stream of payments. So they can be structured either way. There's no there's no rule in stone about how royalty payments uh, and royalty rates are set. And it's not like there's any one particular uh, percentage royalty rate that's that's totally acceptable for one particular thing, and, and another another figure is not. It's a it's a mutual agreement of the parties. Uh, an IP property transaction involving the payment of a royalty is often referred to as, of course, a licensing transaction or a royalty agreement, or simply granting a license for the use of the IP. And uh, a licensing a royalty transaction, uh, excuse me, in a licensing a royalty transaction, the user of the technology does not take ownership of the technology, but rather acquires the right to use the technology for some specified period. And uh, I, I talked about this earlier. Uh, licenses can be granted ex on an exclusive basis to one party, party or it might be uh, a situation where you grant multiple licenses uh, to various users. And in almost all cases, a royalty is structured as a percentage of the gross amount or possibly the net amount that results from the user's sale that are attributable to the particular IP asset that is licensed. Now, uh, this is uh, this is these are not my figures that I'm showing on the screen right now. This was just a survey that was done not long ago. And uh, as it says, royalty rates can be whatever the two parties agree, but over time, royalty rates for IP assets generally have followed this pattern. And you can see the, uh, the dispersion there uh, uh, on the screen of the uh, various royalty rates and, and how many of them uh, fall into these particular ranges. Uh, generally, uh, you hear about royalty rates in, in the in the five to ten percent uh, range. That, that's that's my experience. Uh, I don't know that I've ever dealt with one that was outside of the five to ten percent range. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of one. And. Um, when setting royalty rates, a knowledgeable valuation professional will uh, look where uh, in these various sources uh, that they have uh, that they can come up with to try to find royalty rates for other similar IP assets. You may find them, you may not. Uh, like on the rebate thing uh, that I was looking at, uh, I did actually find a little bit of information on that, but I had to do an incredible amount of digging. Uh, so. Uh, that that is the, is the best uh, the best proof of what uh, these rates uh, should be is uh, if you can point back to some actual examples uh, that have uh, actually uh, been signed up and and, and worked uh, worked out in the in the past. Um, the uh, professional doing the valuation may have a database of rates that they've encountered in the past, uh, or they may have to go. Uh, and the last point there says that they may have to go out and find this, in which case uh, they're going to need to go where to look and, and, and what to look for in terms of uh, past royalty rates. Uh, factors that affect the level of a royalty rate, uh, the uniqueness of the IP technology, that is the scarcity of alternatives, that's a real important factor. And... Uh, the other factor here, second factor, is the cost of the use of similar technologies. And you may be able to find some information on that, uh, but again, that's something that the professional would really have to have to dig out there. And of course, any of these informational items that you have, uh, or your client has, I should say, uh, that you can provide to your valuation professional, that's going to cut down the amount of time that the uh, that the IP professional has to spend. Uh, evaluation professional, excuse me, 
have to spend looking for this information. Um, the cost savings or other savings offered by the technology com when compared to what the user would experience without the use of the IP technology. In other words, how much is this going to save them uh, in terms of production cost or, or whatever. Um, and the next item is synergies with other IP technologies um, that the use of the uh, license technology will produce. Um, you may have a, a, another technology that's already there that the use of this new technology will increase the value of that. So you would attribute that to the, to the value of the new technology. And uh, also the cost that the user would incur to produce an IP technology uh, that would result in the same or similar result uh, without the use of the subject property. This is like a substitution cost. In other words, if you didn't pay for the use of this technology, what would it cost you to basically substitute and, and, and use some other technology uh, by going to another source or by developing it on your own, for example? Um, and then the other factor, of course, the, the, the most common factor are the profits that the use of this license technology uh, will produce for the user. Um, and as I say here in the final analysis, royalty rates are usually set by a negotiation process between the IP owner and the prospective user who wants to license the technology. And uh, more often than not, the resulting royalty rates tend to fall within those ranges cited earlier. Now let's talk about patent infringement a little bit here. Um, this is, uh, of course, a very hot topic. I've been getting a lot of calls on this lately. And uh, from the standpoint of an IP valuation professional, uh, as myself, patent infringement involves two basic components. Um, did patent infringement occur? And typically this is decided by IP professionals before the valuation professional is engaged. But the valuation professional may have some input into that decision as well. But typically this, is, this has been established, and that's why they're calling that's why you would be calling an IP valuation professional, uh, because you determine that it has uh, been infringed. And then secondly, what are the damages that have resulted from the patent infringement? And that's where the uh, IP uh, valuation professional comes in. And um, just from the 30,000-foot view here, determining patent infringement damages is essentially a three-step process. Uh, number one, a realistic and credible estimate of the economic performance of the IP owner without the infringement factor is established. Now, this could be the IP owner or it could be just the IP, uh, IP asset uh, environment that is being examined here in this particular case. Uh, secondly, a realistic and credible estimate of the economic performance of the IP owner or the, or the group of, of, of uh, IP assets after the infringement factor is established. And, I, and, and then I think the easiest way to, uh, to envision this is to just think of this as looking at a graph uh, where you've got uh, a line that represents what the uh, IP owner would have done um, without the infringement and then uh, a lower line that shows what the IP owner is, is, is projected to do or has done. Um, after the, as a result of the infringement. And then the difference between those two lines, as it says in number three here, uh, that's what your, that's what your damages, uh, amount is. The difference in the two resulting figures is present values to an appropriate date, and that might be the date that something happened, such as the infringement or the date that the complaints filed. Uh, lawyers tell me what date to, to do these two usually. Uh, and that's the best estimate of the economic damages of the patent infringement. And, of course, this, this overall process is basically the, the economic damages formula. Uh, you know, what, what, what your uh, performance would have been before and what your performance was after. And the difference in there uh, between those two, you take that over a period of time, you present value that, and um, that's, that's what your damages figure is as of the date that you're uh, doing the valuation uh, to, to show a damage uh, 
of that particular day. Uh, okay, this, uh, this is uh, basically the end of this uh, part of the webinar. Uh, it, uh, as I said, I've hit only some of the high points of IP valuation. It's a very diverse and complex subject. Uh, and reflects the nature of the of IP assets themselves, which, which just vary all over the waterfront. Um, if you require an IP valuation for any purpose, be sure and take it seriously. Make sure you hire someone that thoroughly understands the valuation process, the nature of the IP assets to be valued, and they can withstand examination and defend their valuation at deposition and possibly in court. Okay, we do have some questions for you, Mr. Coker. Um, first one is, if two parties cannot agree on the method to determine the royalty payment, how is it determined? Well, uh, they would have to uh, have some kind of arbitration. Uh, yeah, they would have to go to, if they can't agree, they're going to have to agree uh, on other parties that can actually um, produce this for them. Um, come up with a, with a valuation for them. I've never seen that situation occur, but I think that that's how you would have to handle that. Okay, we do have a few more questions, but at this time we have to um, have our participants enter the tax code from the beginning of the presentation for our CLE credit. So if you could do that at this time, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you to our participants. We have a few more questions. Our next question is, 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 is there a specific issue that you see in your practice that is the predominant issue in IP litigation? Well, I would have to say no, and that is because, they, uh, because of the nature of IP assets. They're just so broad in, in, in general uh, that I've really not seen one issue that would uh, that would uh, I would say is more important than the others. Okay, uh, we have another question. Um, a gentleman named Peter says I have a situation where a patent covers only a small part of a larger software package, allowing online client access to the collection agency database, where the database itself is not patented. How might you value the patented feature in an infringement context? Uh, did, did we qualify these questions as not being too technical? But <laughs> I would have to look at, uh, at that situation um, in order to do that. But uh, basically, this goes back to what I said earlier about the advantage that this produces. Uh, you would have that this particular patented process produces. You would have to look at at, uh, at how this uh, performance would be without the uh, advantage of this IP asset, and then compare that with what it uh, the, the economic performance would be with the application of that asset, and then the difference uh, present value to whatever point uh, you're you're present valuing to would be the uh, valuation for that uh, particular IP asset. Okay. Uh, we also have another question. What is the length of time usually associated with royalties? Well, uh, it, it can be um, it can be anything. Uh, you can you can uh, certainly have a royalty agreement that runs for uh, a few years, or they can just run in perpetuity uh, as to uh, just, just until the uh, person that is. Uh, License uh, is paying for the license for the uh, technology. Decides they don't want to use it anymore. Uh, that that again is just uh, uh, very open uh, and, and is negotiated between the owner of the technology and the user of the technology. This licensing. Okay, a couple more questions. Do IP valuation professionals value all types of IP assets? Or do they specialize in one type of IP asset? 
Well, uh, that depends on the IT professional uh, the, the, that you're talking to. There are some that would only do certain types of assets. Um, I Myself, I value all types of assets, as you probably uh, picked up from the examples that I've thrown out uh, throughout this webinar. But um, you, you, you would need to just check that with your with the particular IP valuation professional uh, that you're talking to, and make sure they're comfortable with the type of assets you're uh, you're dealing with. I mean, I've handled things from computer stuff to, uh, uh, as I said, a cancer detection program. Uh, uh, my uh, uh, own uh, patent application that I uh, sold was a. Uh, an internet-based uh, fraud, check fraud prevention system. So, I, you know, I've had a wide range of, of uh, uh, IP assets that I've valued uh, in various contexts, and I and I have no problem doing that. There are other valuation professionals that would only do software, or would only do uh, uh, machinery, or, or would only do uh, cell phone things or things like that. So uh, you just have to... Make sure that the person you're talking with is, is uh, feels they're qualified to do uh, whatever it is you need to. Okay, uh, we have one more question. What informational materials does the evaluation professional need in order to perform evaluation? Uh, well, they they need to look at the uh, at the patents themselves um, that or whatever the IP. Uh, uh, Assets are that you're that you're talking about. Um, it, it's also good to have a, a good narrative explanation of, of what these IP, IP assets are, or asset or assets might be, and what they uh, uh, how they how they work. And keep in mind that the, the valuation professional is is looking here to determine, uh, as you've probably picked up from uh, this. Uh, this webinar, they're looking for advantages. What does this IP asset produce in terms of an advantage for somebody that might want to buy it or somebody that might want to license it? Uh, so, you know, give them the, the, the narrative information uh, like that. Uh, if, depending on the, on the, the uh, stage that this particular, the development of this particular IP asset is in, um, there might be some financial statements. Uh, that would reflect reflect a performance so far that the um, valuation professional would find uh, helpful. So basically, those those items uh, are, are what you should have in hand to get started with the IP professional, and then uh, that person will give you a, probably a grocery list later on of other things. Okay, we have one final question. Um, kind of a long one. Uh, I have this gentleman has a client who has several wireless patents, but was indicted on another matter. The indictment was dismissed, and they are now we are now suing for malicious prosecution and tortuous interference, etc. Part of our damage claim is the lost value of the patent, and my client's lost royalties when he has to sell part of his patent rights to pay his legal fees. What tips do you have for proceeding with valuing our damage claims? Also, what tips do you have for convincing a judge not to throw the calculation out as speculative? Well, um, the first part of that <clears throat> is uh, basically the same as what I have described um, in this webinar as, a, uh, as the process for valuing uh, the advantage. Here and uh, the, the way you should value this is you should uh, look at, uh, at like I described earlier a graph with two lines. The top line being the uh, income that this person would have generated if he had these uh, patents and didn't have to sell them, and then the lower line would be the uh, actual performance uh, that he has uh, sustained uh, without those without the benefit. And the, the difference between those two lines is, is what, your, uh, what your damages are. You would, you would then take that and present value that uh, back to the date 
that uh, I, I assume that he had to get rid of the assets uh, or, or, or some other appropriate date. And as I say, the attorneys usually have to give me those dates. And uh, what was the second part of that, how to convince a, a judge that it's not speculative? Correct. Uh, yeah, you would only you would only be able. Uh, well, first of all, it these kinds of things are speculative uh, to some degree, uh, but you would want to certainly. Uh, and this is just basic to any kind of economic analysis in court. Uh, tie any of these numbers that you could <clears throat> to real numbers, uh, and that would be. Um, uh, in the case of your client's actual performance, you can do that with financial statements. Um, I would go back and look at the client's uh, performance if there was a period of time uh, before this event happened where he had to get rid of those. I would go back and look at those at the performance uh, that he had during that period of time uh, before, and say uh, and, and say that uh, you know, okay, what would have happened if this had had uh, gone ahead into the future? And uh, use that as your top line of that uh, of that analysis. Okay, thank you for all of the questions and for your response. Um, once again, this this uh, webinar is eligible for CLE credit in Illinois, New Jersey, Missouri, Minnesota, and Texas. So to ensure that you receive your CLE credit, please complete the survey that comes up at the end of the presentation. Once again, the Tasha Group thanks you for your time today, and we thank Mr. Coker for his time as well. And in addition to being your best source for testifying consulting experts, TAFSA is now also offering e-discovery and document management solutions, our free interactive webinars, and research reports on expert witnesses. Once again, thank you very much. I'll be emailing you all a link with a recording of this presentation and a link to the PowerPoint that was used during the presentation. And if you have any questions or follow-up comments, Please send them to our Assistant Vice President, Carol Kozalewski, with her email address listed below. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Coker, for your time. I actually greatly appreciate it. And thank you again, everybody, for your participation today. Have a great day.